You are viewing a briefing on the Coronavirus Aid, Relief, and Economic Security Act that was passed by Congress and signed by the President last Friday in response to the novel coronavirus COVID-19 and the resulting economic insecurity. In this briefing, you will not only hear about the provisions in the bill, but will also learn about the economic supports that the bill provides. This briefing is being recorded April 3rd at 10 a.m., and the information will be presented as currently understood. Information about the bill continues to evolve, including the distribution of guidance by the Small Business Administration late last night. We will offer an update this coming Tuesday afternoon with additional details and questions and answers. Today, after a welcome from Jennifer Leonard, President and CEO of Rochester Area Community Foundation, we will hear presentations from Josh Gawalb, Esquire of Harder C. Chris Emery, John Fogel, Rochester Regional Market President of Five Star Bank, and Todd Butler, President and CEO of Causewave Community Partners. To begin our briefing, allow me to turn it over to Jennifer Leonard. Welcome to all of our partners. Even in the best of times, our nonprofit sector and the work we do is critically important. We distribute food, educate our children, and share our vibrant culture and history. Indeed, we nurture bodies, minds, and spirits and improve the lives of all of our region's residents. And together, in this moment of crisis, we are rising to meet the challenges presented by the novel coronavirus and the COVID-19 disease that it produces. But to do this work, we know that nonprofit organizations need to be sustained. At the Community Foundation, we are grateful to work with many partners. Today, Harder Seacrest and Emory, Five Star Bank, and Causeway Community Partners to invest in and protect the impact that all of you make. You may also be aware of the Community Crisis Fund begun by United Way and the Community Foundation with many philanthropic and community donors that is currently making grants to help the helpers in human services. Fortunately, due to ongoing advocacy with our federal legislators, Congress has recognized our sector's importance and included nonprofit organizations in the new Coronavirus Aid, Relief, and Economic Security Act, known as the CARES Act. Our nonprofit organizations, as well as small businesses, are eligible for payroll protection in the form of forgivable loans and other economic supports that will help you through this trying time. But the $350 billion in the CARES Act for these resources will be distributed on a first come first serve basis. So we need to move urgently to bring these needed funds to our community. This briefing is intended to offer you practical information on the requirements and processes that are necessary to obtain these dollars so that, as a community, we are positioned for a vibrant recovery. We will hear about contents of the legislation from Harder Seacrest and Emory, a law firm that supports Rochester's nonprofits, from a Small Business Administration preferred lender, Five Star Bank, and from Causewave, which will speak about additional causes and resources. Without further ado, allow me to introduce my colleagues Josh Gawold, Esquire from Harder Seacrest and Emory, and John Fogel from Five Star Bank, who will discuss provisions in the legislation. Thank you, Jennifer, for this thank you, Jennifer, for this opportunity to discuss these important topics today. We greatly appreciate this as it's a uh, very much widely discussed within the community and uh, looking forward to going through the materials today. With that, uh, we've got a presentation that uh, should be on the screen right now and uh, looking to page two, we're looking at the disclosure side of things as uh, typical bankers do, especially with an attorney on the, the line with us here. It's important to go through that. Uh, the materials that we're gonna present today are prepared for informational purposes only and uh, not uh, necessarily designed or intended to provide financial, tax, legal, or investment advice uh, from that side. 
The other important thing to note with our presentation today is that this information was prepared based upon the best information that we had earlier this week. And as we uh, have come to find out that there's a, this is an evolving topic and uh, more will come out, as, as Simeon mentioned earlier, next week from our side of things. Uh, as the Small Business Administration provides that additional information and guidance to us. Donna, turning to page four and starting the presentation. We just wanted to uh, hit on the topic that is a preferred Small Business Administration lender. Five Star Bank is here to help small business clients during these uncertain times. It's, as we all know, small businesses are critically important to our local economies and communities. In a five-star bank, our mission is to provide small business customers timely solutions that improve the financial well-being through these uncertain economic times. And we're able to do this specifically uh, through the SBA relief programs as well as other programs that are available through the CARES Act. As a preferred SBA lender, we will be helping certain uh, will be helping clients to quickly navigate the newly passed legislation and gain access to the much needed funds to cover certain operating expenses. As Jennifer mentioned, Congress authorized the program level of three hundred and forty nine billion late last week to provide guaranteeing loans made through this new SBA program, what is called the Paycheck Protection Program, or commonly referred to as PPP for small businesses. What this is, is it's a guaranteed unsecured loan program, which covers up to two and a half times the average monthly payroll expense, up to a maximum of $10 million. And this is to help fund certain operational costs of eligible businesses, organizations, and self-employed persons during this pandemic. Loans under the PPP are available to eligible recipients through June 30th of 2020 with streamlined eligibility criteria. Existing SBA lenders such as Five Star are delegated authority to approve and make loans to these eligible recipients that one, were in operation as of February 15th, 2020, and two, had employees to which they paid salaries and payroll taxes or paid independent contractors. Borrowers also need to make certain good faith certifications that the current economic uncertainty makes the loan necessary and proceeds will be used for retaining workers, maintaining payroll, and cover existing overhead. It should be noted on here, as you can see in bold, that it does not need to show credit was unavailable at this time, which is typically common with the SBA. I should note that, again, real time, uh, we understand that the application for this was just recently released by the SBA and to be specific it does clarify eight to nine different certifications that the borrower will have to make. John this is Josh before you leave the slide I just wanted to note to folks the way that this works is it's been grafted onto an existing SBA loan program and that loan program ordinarily only applies to small businesses that are operated on a for-profit basis in the recent CARES Act, Congress extended that to include nonprofits. The fit of nonprofits with the general program guidance is a little bit unusual because it contemplates for-profit businesses. So what we've tried to do in this presentation, and this will continue throughout all the slides, is for us to try and explain the best we are able based on the guidance that's available to date, how this is going to work for nonprofits. 
um, in um, this new environment. Thanks, Josh. On uh, slide six, we're looking at where and when I can apply and turning to where I can apply is, and that, as we mentioned earlier, it's through any existing SBA lender that's offering this, such as Five Star Bank, which is a preferred SBA lender. When can I apply? That is today, starting April 3rd, 2020. Small businesses and sole proprietors can apply for and receive loans to cover their payroll and certain other expenses through existing SBA lenders. The one thing I'd add here, John, and we've gotten lots of questions on this, is uh, what kind of approvals do I need in order to go into the program from an internal governance perspective? And our answer to that is this is real debt. Um, there's a hope, obviously, that it will be forgiven. And I know later in the presentation, John, you go through the criteria under which it would be forgiven. Um, however, it's styled as debt, and if um, the borrower doesn't do the things that it's required to do, it could end up having to pay this back. So we believe that um, whatever approvals would ordinarily be required at your organization to um, take out indebtedness um, would apply um, here. For example, um, can your executive committee do it itself, or do your bylaws require your board to do it? Um, are there certain uh, criteria under which the executive director or CEO is authorized to borrow without going up um, to uh, uh, approval at a higher level of governance. So I'd urge all nonprofits to think about this just like they would think about any other borrowing when considering an internal approval. Thanks, Josh. Also, you'll see on page six, it's starting April 10th of 2020, independent contractors and self-employed individuals can apply for and receive loans to cover their payroll and other certain expenses. On slide seven, we talk about PPP eligibility. This covers eligible small business concerns, business concerns, nonprofit organizations, as Josh mentioned, veterans organizations, individuals who operate sole proprietors as sole proprietors, and independent contractors, self-employed individuals, and tribal business concerns. As Josh mentioned, and I think he'll elaborate on right now, that it's very unique that they did include nonprofit organizations with this particular act program. Yeah, that's right. And, you know, there's a definition in here of nonprofit that's really um, rather restrictive. It's 501c3s only. So your social clubs, your business leagues, your social welfare organizations, um, those aren't eligible. Um, interestingly, um, you know, there's an alphabet soup of different relief programs here. And for the EIDL, which is not the subject of this presentation, but I'll, I'll touch on a little bit later, um, you can um, have a broader class of nonprofits, non-501c3s apply. But for the um, PPP, which we're talking about now, 501c3s only. Um, another very, very important point, um, in some of the earlier versions of the legislation, there was an exclusion for organizations receiving Medicaid funding. Um, that, thankfully, was not included in the final bill. Um, so those organizations are eligible to apply. But if you're a 501c3, um, the bottom line is you are eligible uh, for the PPP program. Thanks, Josh. One of the other uh, eligibility criteria has to do with the size of the, the business. And as you see on slide seven, it's uh, the greater of 500 employees or a, uh, an existing SBA size standard for employees in the industry, which is tied to a specific code there. Uh, generally speaking, we're working with the assumption that it's going to be a, uh, the employee size of 500. As you'll see on the bullet point right under this uh, specific outline there is that for the accommodation and food service businesses, you can have up to 500 employees per physical location. So it's not the 
overall employment, but it's per physical location. And the employee can count, uh, the employee count can include full-time, part-time, or other hires in that. And I think Josh has some comments regarding this. Yeah, so, the, you know, the first thing to say is, um, you know, normally when you're checking your eligibility um, as a quote-unquote small business under SBA standards, you have to go on the SBA website and look up, you know, what is quote-unquote small um, uh, for your um, type of business based on your NAICS code. You don't have to do that here. Um, because in the Act, they said for the purposes of these loans in particular, a business that has um, under 500 employees is eligible. Um, this is important for nonprofits because um, some of uh, the nonprofit uh, NAICS codes don't have small standards because the existing uh, SBA programs don't apply to them. Okay, so you're just looking here just at the 500 employee um, uh, standard. Now, the number one question that we've been getting from different organizations um, in the nonprofit context is, well, how do you determine 500 employees? I have a group of affiliated organizations that work together. Um, when you look at um, them individually, they're below 500. If you look at them together, they're above 500. And what's tricky here is that the affiliation rules, again, and this is obviously a theme, are not designed for the nonprofit context. Because the way that the CARES Act works is it, it ties into existing SBA regulations regarding affiliation that are designed for the for-profit context. And those are very, very broad rules that are designed to capture um, indirect um, uh, linkages as well as direct um, stock ownership. And when you try and apply, apply them in this context, is a little bit tricky. Um, but what we've learned this week answering questions for people is that membership interests, right, this unique type of control in the nonprofit context, even though it's not specifically contemplated um, by the regulations, uh, appears to fall under the regulations. Another kind of um, uh, control relationship that you often see um, are overlapping boards, right? There are five nonprofits in a group. They don't have any formal uh, affiliation with each other except as a practical matter, the boards of each organization are always replaced in tandem. And um, what we have uh, determined looking through those rules is that overlap of boards creates the kind of uh, control relationship that uh, requires affiliation um, in, in this context. So um, I, I would urge people to um, consult with uh, their uh, attorneys or accountants on these affiliation rules um, to make sure that um, you're not falling into uh, a trap here uh, based on uh, how they operate. Another question that we have been getting is um, whether each organization um, in the group needs to apply uh, separately. Um, and uh, we have uh, suggested that as a, a conservative um, matter. Um, I don't think people know, but we wouldn't want uh, one organization to not be eligible uh, or the employees of that organization not to be uh, counted uh, in computations uh, as a technical matter. So we've been representing, uh, recommending uh, separate applications for related organizations in a group uh, as a prophylactic matter. Again, guidance uh, came down last night, and uh, uh, more guidance is expected, and we'll be updating this next week to reflect uh, all of that guidance, uh, including as it relates uh, to these subjects. John? Great, great information there, Josh. Thank you. Turning to, to slide eight, talking about the PPP maximum loan amounts. As you'll see here, the bill authorizes loan amounts up to the lesser of $10 million two and a half times the average monthly payroll costs, plus the value of any existing emergency injury disaster loan, which is commonly referred to as an EIDL loan, received after January 31st of 2020. So there's been lots of discussion on this. The, the guidelines should, uh, that came out last night should define this a little better. We're believing that the expectation is for most companies that 
the two and a half times average monthly payroll costs will be based upon your 2019 average monthly payroll costs. As you see in a bullet point here, there are some special provisions for seasonal businesses, which we believe the measurement period will be February 15th of 2019 to June 30th of 2019 for their average monthly payroll costs. And there are also uh, special uh, pro uh, provisions for startups, which we believe will be from measured from January 1st of 2020 to February 29th of 2020. Turning to slide nine, we discuss more of the maximum loan amounts where the PPP sets out a comprehensive definition of payroll costs, such as to include salary, cash tips, leave benefits, insurance, retirement benefits. However, it does exclude a couple things. One is the compensation of any individual that's in excess of $100,000 and compensation paid to any employees residing outside the United States. You'll, you'll see on the second bullet point here that for sole proprietors and independent contractors, payroll costs are similarly defined and include annual compensation, commission, and other similar payments up to $100,000. Turning to slide 10, we talk about allowable uses for loan proceeds. And you'll see here that they're intended to cover up to eight weeks of payroll expenses and other amounts for making payments towards allowable certain expenses and debt obligations defined as rent, including rent under an existing lease agreement, payments of interest on any mortgage obligation, costs related to the continuation of group health and benefits during the affected period, as well as paid sick, medical and family leave and insurance premiums, and interest on other debt obligations that were incurred before an effect, the affected period. So in other words, the calculation that we talked about earlier was set at your average monthly payroll times two and a half, which gives you some excess there of that uh, 0.5 times your average monthly payroll to help offset some of these other certain expenses that are outlined here. This also talks about on page 11, also talks about the payments of these loans. Lenders are required to defer payments on these PPP loans. It says here for, uh, for between six months and a year, but we believe that it's gonna be six months. And we believe that that deferment period starts with the disbursement date of the loan. As uh, we mentioned several times here, uh, this should be further spelled out in the guidelines that came out in future guidelines and more of an update on Tuesday when we talk again. Josh, I think you had some comments here. Nothing further. Okay. Turning to page 12 is uh, where uh, folks get even more excited about this particular program is the loan forgiveness part. As you'll see on this page, the following expenses occurred from February 15th to June 30th are eligible for loan forgiveness, obviously payroll, but in addition to that, it's mortgage, rent, utility costs, as we talked before. The loan is forgiven at the end of a certain period, which is uh, likely to be an eight week period. The borrowers were, the borrowers, it's intended that the borrowers will work with the lenders to verify their covered expenses and work with the amount of the forgiveness that is calculated during that time. The covered period during which these expenses can be forgiven it goes from February 15th to June 30th. 
And it's important, also important to note that amounts forgiven will be excluded from gross income for federal income tax purposes. Yeah, and I, I did want to comment there. I mean, obviously, the uh, 501c3 organizations are not uh, reporting um, uh, income tax in the same manner as um, for-profit recipients. Uh, we obviously uh, expect that um, the amounts forgiven will also be excluded um, from uh, UBIT. Um, you know, one uh, sort of little question uh, that arises is, well, how is this reported on Form 990? Um, I, I expect it will be treated as a governmental grant. Um, you know, that has some implications for computing public support percentage, uh, et cetera. And uh, I'm sure that uh, over time, the accounting community will come up with uh, uh, a practice on that. Um, but for now, the good news, um, no, uh, no, no tax on the forgiveness of this debt. Thanks, Josh. And from our perspective, we're still waiting further clarification and uh, review of the guidelines to define and understand exactly what information is going to be required to support the um, monthly payroll calculations and also in regards to the reporting that's going to be necessary towards the end of this loan in regards to calculating the potential forgiveness. But uh, we, we do think some further clarification regarding this is outlined on page 13, where uh, we, we fully expect that the amount of the loan forgiveness will not exceed the principal amount of the loan. And this is put in place in order to incentivize the retention of employees at existing sal ex salaries. The amount of loan forgiveness will be reduced if there is an employee headcount reduction or salary reduction in excess of 25% during the covered period. It does allow that if the borrower reverses any headcount or salary reductions prior to June 30th, the borrower's eligibility for loan forgiveness will be preserved, may be preserved. And if you lay off, if you still lay off employees, the forgiveness will be reduced by the percent of decrease in the number of employees laid off. So in simple terms, we're going to have a calculation, likely have a calculation at the beginning of this period, which is your monthly average payroll times two and a half to get you a loan amount. And then at the end of your period, you're going to have a similar calculation to understand what that, uh, the difference might be. In addition to that, they will be, the SBA will be requiring folks to certify what the uses of the loan proceeds were used for, and those calculations will at the end determine what is the, the potential forgiveness of this loan that's out there. Josh, I think you were going to co comment on uh, our, the seasonal side of things. Oh, no, you know, I, I think you've covered it. The, the, the point here is that there are various things that could occur, and there are special situations in, in which, um, you know, you could inadvertently run into a trap where um, the, the loan um, would not be forgiven because of what you ended up um, uh, doing in the future. So it's just something for, you know, nonprofits and boards, particularly in a fiduciary context, to be aware of this, this, this is debt subject to forgiveness. It's not um, a grant in the first instance. Thank you. And as, uh, just to take off on that point a little bit, that the borrowers will be, re as in, and as I mentioned earlier, the borrowers will be required to provide additional documentation to substantiate their eligibility for this forgiveness. Turning to page 14, other imp important things to uh, note with this PPP, program is that there will be no fees charged to the borrower. The SBA will not collect a fee for the covered loan during the period. That is somewhat unique. And in addition to that, and very important, as I mentioned earlier, there's no credits, necessarily no credit statistics that we're aware of that will be uh, reviewed in this underwriting. There are no personal guarantees. 
or there is and there is no collateral going to be required for these particular loans. I love the personal guarantee in this context. You got to get the the executive director to put a mortgage on their home to guarantee this. Just the April Fools. There are no personal guarantees at all, and and, and certainly none for nonprofits. Thanks, Josh. Uh, slide uh, 15 really just uh, talks about some contact information for the bank. If you needed to reach out to, to folks or myself, feel free to, uh, to have further discussions about this. Page 16 discusses some other SBA relief programs that are out there. In particular, I wanted to highlight uh, two specific ones. One. We should get some more details and guidance here very soon, but it uh, applies specifically to the existing SBA loans, and there is going to be a, a payment relief program. And that will, uh, like I said, be defined here shortly, but it's expected that the SBA will make direct payments of SBA loan obligations for up to six months to lenders for the SBA loans that are out there at this time. Another program that's out there that is direct through the SBA and, and you don't have to go to one of the SBA lenders or preferred lenders is called the Economic Injury Disaster Relief Program. That's been out there for uh, a few weeks now, particularly here in New York. And that gives you the opportunity for to go directly with the, to the SBA for up to $2 million, potential 30-year financing, at a maximum rate of 3.75%. 3 but as we alluded to earlier, if you do pursue that avenue or already have and are pursuing the PPP program, that will be rolled into one and included in your $10 million maximum loan amount. This completes our presentation here from our perspective, and we appreciate the opportunity to discuss these important topics, which will support our community, and uh, look forward to chatting more on Tuesday once we've had a chance to further review the guidelines and define some of the specifics within the program and share with you at that time. Thank you, John. I, I think um, uh, tech folks, there were a couple more slides up there um, on some tax matters. If you want to put those back up, it would be great. Wonderful. So, uh, folks, we just wanted to add, in addition to our focus on the PPP, um, some uh, additional benefits in the CARES Act and other legislation that might be applicable um, to nonprofit organizations. Um, the first one is the employee retention credit. So the way that this is structured um, is uh, as a credit against the employer's share of Social Security taxes. Now remember, um, when you have an employee, um, there's a portion of their Social Security that the employer pays. There's a portion that the employee pays. In order to get money to organizations really quickly, um, what the CARES Act does is that it allows employers to not remit their share of Social Security taxes um, uh, within certain parameters uh, to get uh, cash into the system really quickly. Um, in addition, you can get a refund of uh, Social Security taxes if the um, amount um, that uh, you would be paying is not enough um, to get you the relief for which you qualify. And this applies to a smaller group of employers than the PPP. It's organizations uh, whose operations were suspended or whose quarterly receipts have dropped precipitously, uh, more than uh, 50%, and there's a per employee cap. Um, very importantly for this and for um, the next uh, relief we'll talk about with respect to delay of payroll taxes, if you do receive a PPP loan, you're not eligible um, uh, uh, for this. Uh, so another way to get cash into the system really quickly, particularly for organizations um, that do not qualify for uh, PPP loans. Um, the other one, and, and, and this one, um, is um, uh, not an elimination, uh, but rather a deferral, 
is just simply this program which allows you to take the 2020 Social Security tax payments and pay them in in, in the end of the year in 21 and 22. And again, employers who have uh, debt um, that's forgiven under the CARES Act aren't eligible um, for this one either. So two options here, particularly of interest to those uh, who, uh, for whatever reason, uh, are, are not pursuing the PPP financing. Just a few more things on the next slide. Um, overlooked a little bit um, in, in, in this uh, are some uh, charitable giving incentives that I think are worth noting. Um, you know, usually um, for charitable giving, there's a limitation that says, hey, you can't just give away your whole income and not pay any income tax as a result of it. Um, and uh, under tax reform for a gift to a public charity, um, that, that's 60% only of your income that you can offset by gifts during this year. Uh, for folks who are feeling really generous and want to give away their entire income uh, to coronavirus relief, um, the AGI limitation has been lifted this year. Um, and uh, one can receive credit up to 100% of their income uh, for uh, charitable giving of any sort. Um, uh, during during 2020. Um, this will be of uh, great interest to a, a, a small group of individuals for whom that AGI limitation uh, affects their uh, charitable uh, gift planning. Unfortunately, um, gifts to DAF, such as the Community Foundation, are not eligible uh, for that greater um, uh, uh, limit if you're giving to a DAF that you have at RICF, but RICF does have other uh, giving uh, uh, opportunities. Um, in addition, um, there's a small above-the-line deduction of $300 that's been added in. Um, as you guys know, under tax reform in um, uh, states like New York, it's hard for many filers to get benefits for their charitable giving. Um, but there's a special $300 deduction uh, that's available for all for this year only. Uh, a couple other miscellaneous things. Um, this one on the unemployment is really very interesting. Um, some nonprofits in New York choose to self-insure for unemployment tax purposes rather than purchase insurance. And the uh, CARES Act um, helps provide assistance for half of what uh, those nonprofits would need to pay um, in, in connection with uh, unemployment uh, resulting um, from the act. Um, some other miscellaneous topics. Uh, we talked a little bit about the economic injury disaster loan, um, so I'm going to skip uh, that. Um, emergency paid sick leave. Um, this, this is another uh, benefit that's uh, applicable um, to uh, nonprofits uh, under uh, the Families First Coronavirus Response Act, which is the legislation that was signed now um, two weeks ago. Um, employers, including nonprofits, um, receive um, tax credits to reimburse them for the cost of certain sick and family leave wages uh, directly related to uh, COVID-19. There's a 500 employer rule here, though the computation of that rule is different. Um, this is applicable to um, nonprofits as well as uh, uh, for-profit organizations. And then finally, um, and this is not under any new legislation, it's just under general um, tax principles. Um, there are opportunities for uh, nonprofit employers to um, make payments directly to their employees that are non-taxable to help uh, the employees cope with the financial impact of the pandemic on them. Um, specific uh, impacts uh, for which employers can uh, create a new type of employee benefit to help with necessary personal family living or, uh, God forbid, funeral expenses as a result of this disaster. Um, we have information on all of these um, uh, uh, miscellaneous items uh, on our website, um, and there's lots of uh, good uh, information out there. In particular, as flagged in here, I, I, I think that independent sector which is a trade group for nonprofits, has done a really nice job um, analyzing um, these things as they apply to nonprofits. Uh, that's all we've got. Um, John and I are, of course, happy to answer any questions um, on our Tuesday um, follow-up call. Um, so please feel free to reach out. Thank you so much for having us. 
Good afternoon. This is uh, Todd Butler. I'm the president and CEO of Causewave Community Partners and really pleased to have the opportunity to speak with you all today about the impact of the coronavirus on nonprofit organizations and some support that Causewave has been able to provide for nonprofit organizations seeking uh, guidance and assistance and consultation regarding this issue. Causewave is a nonprofit organization and has been in existence since 1950, was founded as the Ad Council of Rochester, and generally provides two types of partnerships with the community. The first is what we call capacity building with organizations, and the second is community impact with coalitions. So the work that we're doing now to help organizations cope with the impact of the coronavirus certainly falls underneath this, uh, the capacity building with organizations category. Our community impact with coalitions work is a wide variety of activity from lead poisoning prevention to some work we've been doing over the past two weeks with the Monroe County Health Department for public health messaging. But today we want to talk a little bit about a program that we launched uh, after the effects became more clear of the coronavirus on our community. So we have offered uh, to the nonprofit community uh, what we're calling COVID-19 consults. Um, they are free consultations with Causewave staff and community volunteers who have raised their hand to help the nonprofit sector. In the first 48 hours after the announcement of these free consultations, we had 42 scheduled. Uh, and over the last week or so, we've uh, um, nearly doubled that amount. And so many nonprofit organizations are taking advantage of this uh, opportunity to gain some outside perspective on uh, the variety of issues that we often have not had to think about seriously before. Some of the topics that we're covering in these consults uh, are shown on the screen. Crisis communications uh, is a topic that many organizations uh, um, have not planned for in advance and uh, and now is the time to to have those conversations and be ready for a uh, crisis like the one we're in or uh, other crises that might affect your individual organization during this uh, situation. Uh, internal and external communications with constituents and stakeholders is something we've been talking to many organizations about and uh, that's uh, been helpful to many to have a, a thought partner on, on the best way to do that. Fundraising has been a very uh, popular topic as well. Many organizations have had to cancel or postpone their events and many other organizations uh, are also uh, trying to figure out exactly how to interact with their donors now and, and should they be fundraising, should they be reaching out, uh, or is now not the appropriate time. And the, the answer to that is different for every organization, and we're, we're happy to help organizations sort that out. Another uh, topic we've talked with many organizations about is how to leverage your programs and your expertise uh, to benefit the community during this crisis. Uh, you do not have to be a uh, public health delivering organization to have a relevant uh, role during this crisis. And so we're trying to help organizations figure out how they can help uh, families stay busy at home or how they can help uh, folks figure out how to interact uh, with their loved ones without uh, violating some of the public health recommendations around uh, social distancing. Many organizations are transitioning to virtual operations, have been forced to do that, and are looking for ways to continue to interact with folks that they normally interacted with face-to-face -face in the form of their clients or their customers. We've been helping organizations sort that out, identify free or low-cost tools that are available to them to do that. Uh, many organizations are uh, pivoting their priorities. Some organizations have had to shut down a lot of their operations, and uh, but they still are able to maintain some of their staff and are looking for ways to, uh, uh, to address uh, the community's needs in addition to their organization's sustainability. And many of the conversations we've been having have really been around identifying opportunities to sustain the mission of the organization. So, uh, 
th those are some of the topics we've been talking about. And, and I would say that uh, the next slide here identifies uh, in the red box a, a comment that we heard from one that's represented of by the feeling of many. Just having uh, an external thought partner uh, to help think through what we know now, uh, identify what we don't know now, and how we're going to move forward uh, successfully as an organization is something that's provided a lot of comfort to, to organizations and given them some, some really tangible next steps to take. But generally, some of the guidance we've been sharing with organizations is that now is not the time uh, for silence. It can feel like uh, you want to stay out of the din, but uh, if we can have the contributions we're making to the conversation adding to understanding as opposed to adding to noise, then, then now is certainly not the time uh, for silence. So we're encouraging organizations to talk to your staff more than you ever have before. Uh, uh, regular updates on a weekly basis, if not more frequently, are very important to your staff. Talking to your donors, checking in with them, seeing how they're doing, and uh, letting them know how this is affecting your organization uh, and giving them the chance uh, to do something is, is a real opportunity uh, that you can present to, uh, to, to your supporters and, and to your donors. So we are uh, here to help the nonprofit sector. We are recruiting volunteers with specific uh, uh, PPP program expertise to help think through whether this is a good opportunity for your organization or not. And we uh, are eager to have the opportunity to serve more organizations. And on the CauseWave website, which is www.causewave.org, there is a link to, to go ahead and directly schedule a, a session for yourself and your organization and uh, tell us a little bit more about what you want to talk about. And CauseWave staff will uh, be matched with that as well as uh, community volunteers who are looking to help the nonprofit sector be successful uh, on the other side of this crisis. So, that's all that I was going to share, and I would encourage uh, nonprofit organizations, uh, staff, or uh, volunteers to uh, to reach out to take us up on those uh, that offer. So this concludes our briefing for today. Thank you for viewing, and thanks again to our presenters, uh, Josh Gawalb, John Fogel, and Todd Butler for volunteering their expertise in these very uncertain times. Because the CARES Act resources are being offered on a first-come, first-served basis, we hope that you're taking away practical and actionable steps that allow you to act decisively, uh, including contacts uh, from uh, our presenters today to pursue more information and ultimately to obtain the economic supports. Again, this information is current as of April 3rd, and we will offer an update to the briefing, which will include a facilitated question and answer session this coming Tuesday, April 7th. Visit www.recf.org slash cares hyphen briefing for more information. Perhaps this briefing has stimulated more questions. If that is the case, please send those questions to grants at recf.org. Again, you can email any questions to grants at recf.org. Those questions will be the basis for the follow-up briefing update and Q&A on Tuesday. Questions that do not get answered on Tuesday will be forwarded to the appropriate presenter. We look forward to continuing our partnership with you as we strengthen our region. Please stay safe and thank you.